Good evening. This is Mae Bressel. This is broadcast number 553, and it's July the 12th, 1982. As I've reminded you in the past few weeks, this is a listener-sponsored station. This is entirely dependent upon contributions, and if possible, we'd appreciate sending membership here to help keep this station going. This is different than the other station that I was at for so many years that was privately owned. This station needs your contributions. You can send $15 a year membership, $10 for senior or student, and you can send a lot more if you have some money to show them that you appreciate this kind of broadcasting. The address here is Box 206 Pacific Grove, California 93950, or you can write to me at home or write to KZU, K-A-Z-U, here in Pacific Grove. Another matter, this coming Sunday I'm going to be at MPC from 4 to 6. It's a fundraising for the station. They asked me if I would get together with you and answer some questions. Now, I've been on the air a long time, and I have a lot of views that I base my opinions on research, magazines, books, government documents. But you have a lot of questions that you want to ask, and it's a good chance to get together. It's $5 for the station. But I'll answer some questions that I get frequently on the telephone today. Before I came in this morning, a friend called she had a friend who wanted to ask me some questions. I said, bring him over Sunday, and it's from 4 to 6, and if it lasts longer and we can't stay in the music hall, we'll stay outside, and the weather's nice. We can be out in the grass or at, at MPC, and I'll stay until I answer your questions if, and take them in turn and see what we can learn from this of sharing our information. Radio shouldn't be a one-way uh, where I'm giving out this information every week. It, it should be in listeners being able to answer, ask me questions, and I'll answer them for you. There's some areas that I'd like to get into, such as um, how do you separate what is fact in the news when you read so much as against propaganda? Or how do you get started in showing your interest in certain subjects and finding the answers to them, suspicion about certain murders or mass murders, such as Jonestown or the Kennedy assassinations or John Lennon or the John Belushi or airplane crashes? How do you get started studying these various things and uh, what is the motivating factor in taking that giant leap from being interested to being really concerned and making some changes in your life and getting answers to these questions. And these questions are answered by documents and research and one of the things that's important is that each of you who has the feeling that you don't like what is going on is not alone. I get calls and letters all the time from people saying, I don't have friends who think like I do. I don't know anybody who thinks and uh, discusses these things. And yet I can cite thousands of books that are published, that are available, writers doing the research, references, the publishers put their uh, investment behind them, the material's out there for you. There are other people, and you're not alone. And the other, another factor to discuss is at what age do you get started? Some people at 16 are very politically aware. Other people like myself, are retards. I didn't start until I was 40 years old. We'll discuss the role of the mafia in the government, the shootings of John Lennon and Ronald Reagan, the Pope, the Hoffa killing. There's a lot of um, information in the news every day, and I think it's important to discuss the connecting links. What you read very often are the isolated events, and what I try to study is what do these events have in common, and are the people manipulating them the same people behind the events, and how did they get their power, and if it's illegal, what can we do about it? And uh, uh, this morning's paper was filled with information of NATO and the European countries being afraid of Ronald Reagan, that he'd gone to Europe and Tanama gave a war speech. They're afraid of World War III. Um, Reagan for sure wants World War III. Can it be avoided? Can people make changes? with their lives, what would you invest in terms of time and energy if you thought it could be avoided? Or are you willing to just be a puppet and sit back and say, well, this is it, it's going to come, and uh, I give up? Just before I came to the station uh, this afternoon, I picked up my mail, and there was a letter from one of my favorite world watchers in Texas, and he is the person who started me looking for the Nazi Fritz Kramer, the man behind Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger, and uh, he had some articles that he sent to me, one I didn't have, from the New York Times, February the 19th, 1979, how Fritz Kramer, the enemy of publicity, shaped Kissinger's thought and action. And then there's another article from the Sunday uh, Magazine section of the Washington Post, 
March 2nd, 1975, The Iron Mentor, Why Even Henry Kissinger Needs Dr. Fritz Kramer. Now, the interest in Fritz Kramer that I have mentioned many weeks back, and I'm continuously studying as much as I can, night and day on this particular person, has to be, is the question is, in the, is the man in the Pentagon who's advising the chief of staffs, who is behind the Korean War, the Vietnam War in Laos and Cambodia, the bloodbath in Central America, the military dictatorships in South America, the bloodbath in the Middle East at the present time. Is this Fritz Kramer, uh, who's an advisor to Hessinger when he was Secretary of State and National Security Council, the advisor to Creighton Abrams, General Vernon Walter, who's now our roving deputy ambassador, Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, and the who's who of the Pentagon. Is this the man who has worked at the Pentagon for 27 years, the same Fritz Kramer, who was Hitler's chief of staff from the time Hitler started the Gestapo, Hitler's most trusted Fritz Kramer, are they the same man? When World War II was over, did Fritz Kramer, the Nazi, who sat in the docket at Dachau, prisoner 33, uh, was he brought to the United States, to the Pentagon, where our country became an extension of Nazi Germany, and between Reinhard Galen and Fritz Kramer and Otto Skorzeny and the bankers of Adolf Hitler, Hallmar Schacht, and the team of bankers behind Adolf Hitler, the IG Farben country, Company, did they take over the Constitution of the United States and the United States? Now, it should be a simple answer. The answer should be very easy uh, to get from the Pentagon. I wrote to Congressman Panetta. He sent me a letter and said he agreed it was very serious. He'd write to the Pentagon. That was May the 6th. Or, w there's been no answer June, and now this is July. It's two months. I have written to Freedom of Information at the Pentagon. I got an answer last week. They never heard the no record of Fritz Kramer. Uh, I believe sincerely that we should find out now if Hitler's top agents made a deal with Alan Dulles and with Nelson Rockefeller and Chase Manhattan and the multinational bankers, the Morgans and so forth, and ITT, IG Farben, did they make a deal to bring Nazi Germany to the Pentagon to take over our country? This is the primary problem in this uh, country today. I believe it is, and that's why the war talk going on in Europe at the present time. You could take Kissinger and Haig out of the White House or the State Department right now, but they are still very influential, and their agents are all over the world, and Fritz Kramer has been really not seen at all except for possibly one picture since he came to the United States. Now, I have one picture of him in the United States and one picture of him at Dachau, and I have reason to believe it's the same man. In fact, this letter that I got from... Uh, a friend in Texas, I don't know if he wants me to put his name on the air, so I won't. Many of you know who he is. It's to the Congressional Research Library of Congress dated June 15, 1982. I will pay whatever the cost required for this lookup to answer, one, what is the relationship of Fritz Kramer, the Iron Mentor in the Pentagon, to Hitler's SS General Fritz Kramer in the trial at Dachau. He put it Nuremberg, but he was at the Dachau trial. And if you go through the index of every book on Nazi Germany, they have excluded, the American historians have excluded the trial of Dachau, except for maybe two or three books out of 1,000 that I've gone through. And another listener who has been following this Kramer story uh, very well has sent many, many pictures and book quotations about um, the missing Kramer or the Kramer. He asks, what is the relationship to, if these are not the same person, then where, where were the two Fritz Kramers after the Battle of the Bulge? They were both in the Battle of the Bulge in a geographic area of about 28 to 30 miles. We have 20 to 30 people who control the world today, uh, and running our State Department, our National Security Council. And it's very urgent, even though I was going to do other news today because of this uh, fear of uh, Chancellor Schmidt flew over to see George Schultz and their, Europe is afraid of Ronald Reagan and the ability of Reagan to cause World War III even by sending in troops. Maybe he gave Begin the go-ahead to get into Lebanon so then we could bring in the troops and get our foothold over there. And then in this letter he said to the Congressional Research, is the monocle-eyed Fritz Kramer for 30 years the planning officer in the Pentagon a United Na Nations a U.S. citizen? Does he belong in the U.S.A.? And also, fourth, was Reagan's secretary 
or it isn't was she is Helene von Dom, a Nazi party member before she came over here. Does she have now or ever had a relation to Kramer? Well, I can answer that. I don't know what Congress will tell him. Helene von Dom, there's an article about her in the paper last week, and I mentioned her with regard to Otto von Bolschwing. He was Adolf Eichmann's superior. He worked in Palestine in the 30s. He was a spy. He ran the Dutch Nazi organization during the war, taking the property from Jews and other people and putting it into Swiss banks. He helped rescue the entire Romanian Iron Guard that was brought up on television recently, along with the Belarusa Nazis that were active in exterminations. Otto von Bolschwang moved to California, worked for Hewlett Packard for the Defense Department, worked with Edwin Wilson, Frank Turbill, the Shah of Iran, and he brought over and worked with Helene von Damme. Now, Helene came from Vienna, and she was brought to Detroit and then Chicago. And when Ronald Reagan was to become the governor, she latched on to the Sacramento connections. She married a German by the name of von Damme, a German international banker. And she was the secretary to the governor in California when we had our uh, Reichstag kind of confrontations, the California violences that Ronald Reagan was so good at from 1968 to 1974. And Helene von Dahm then went to Washington. About two weeks ago, she was moved from the Oval Office. I kept saying on the air that she was right next door. Now she's a block away, but she screens every single appointment, every cabinet appointment. And if you follow the appointments of uh, this Ronald Reagan, such as his J. Peter Grace, who's been a business partner with Otto Ambrose, one of the most notorious Nazi criminals that was supposed to be hung at Nuremberg, the entire cabinet of Ronald Reagan was formed by and with people involved directly with Adolf Hitler's SS with Nazi Germany. Now, Helene married von Damm. It would be interesting to know a, how a woman who makes all decisions for appointments for the President of the United States had a German international bank or husband. We don't know what bank, whether it's affiliated with the same banks that had funded Adolf Hitler that are funding the world Nazi movement at the time. And then recently, she had divorced Von Damm, and she recently married somebody from New Jersey. Now, her name has been brought up in connection with uh, Raymond Donovan in not allowing Raymond Donovan to be fired. And he's from New Jersey and very much linked to the Reinhardt Galen, um, the OSS that became the CIA, the Nazi network. So in Washington, D.C., we have a dilemma that one particular person in Texas and myself are barraging the uh, Pentagon, the Defense Department, the uh, intelligence agencies, the Freedom of Information for facts. And the only way I can uh, keep this thing going, I'm going to bring it up many, many times on the air because I actually believe, and it's worth the risk, what if we prove to be wrong that uh, Mr. Fritz Kramer, Hitler's Fritz Kramer, went off into the blue yonder and never but hit a history book after the Dachau trials where he was released. Senator Joe McCarthy and Father Walsh from Georgetown University made a point of releasing his cohorts, Mr. Piper and Mr. Dietrich, who gunned down the Americans. They didn't take any prisoners the Battle of Bulge. Those men were released by a new congressman and a team of Nazis in the United States. So where did Kramer go? And I believe that we could... If we could find that this is the same Kramer, we could say, hey, we've had enough and have a scandal bigger than Watergate. I talked to Seymour Hirsch from the New York Times recently about a month ago because he has a new book out on Hagen Kissinger. And he knows for it's Kramer, but uh, he's, his book is dated during the Watergate era. And I said, uh, do you know where he was in these years from 1944 to 46? Was he sitting as a prisoner and our history books negated the entire trial of Dachau because it did exist. Men came over, there's books on it, uh, just briefly mentioned, uh, you know, just one or two paragraphs in a book. But it's a non-existent part of American history. And uh, Seymour said, if these are the same Kramer, Hitler's Kramer is our Kramer, you're on the biggest story in the country. And I'll uh, talk with you some more Sunday when I see you, and I'll be doing a lot more on it, but it's terribly important so I wanted to tell you again today that this friend did write to the Library of Congress, and we're getting absolutely no satisfaction. 
Now, there was a story, and I want to do a little bit on the Israel, the PLO problem, the story in the news today, the PLO influence will remain even if it abandons Beirut. And this is from the Los Angeles Times. It said, if the PLO leaves Beirut, as the Israelis insist, much of the PLO will stay intact. The framework will stay intact. Recently, the PLO sold its Wall Street stock portfolio and switched to the money market certificates because they're liquidated faster. The PLO has a budget approximate $1 billion. It's financed primarily by Saudi Arabia, and it is sure to receive more financial aid once the Lebanese crisis is resolved. The money pays for PLO operations in some form, no matter what happens. Hospitals, factories, security force, schools, payroll, pensions. It's as one Western diplomat said, the PLO is the second largest employer in Lebanon. The first was the Lebanon government itself. Now, in the Washington Post this last week, Claire Sterling, who wrote The Terror Network, had an interesting comment on the PLO because she's put so much of the terrorism on the left, on the Soviet Union, and I've said for a long time that the PLO was funded by the United States, the Central Intelligence Agency, British intelligence. She has an article in the Washington Post, After Lebanon, a wave of anti-Semitism and terror. She said, by now, the Palestine resistance is so closely identified with the worldwide left that few still remember its original ties with the anti-Semitic right. The right was there first. Europe's black international, an assortment of Nazis, new Nazis, fascists, and phalanges, and pushes from Hitler's Reich, a good 20 years ago emerged as the Red International to embrace the anti-Zionist cause. The left joined them in 1968 when George Habash sent a team to hijack the El Al plane in Rome, marking the Palestinian guerrilla's fateful entry into Europe. By 1969, the Black International was meeting in Barcelona to discuss the ways and means of arming and training Palestinian forces in the Middle East and collecting elements disposed to collaborate in the act of sabotage in Europe later. By that time, a year or two later, the left-wing terrorists from West Germany, Italy, Sweden, and North Ireland began to train with the PLO in the Middle East so that the left joined the right. But Clara Sterling says that was the left-wing before it joined it was set up by the uh, Nazis, the Black International, and the Falange group. Now, I have a book on the Falange. Uh, in fact, somebody sent me some copies of a page of it this week. I do have a book on the Falange. It's called The Axis Secret Army in the Americas by Alan Chase, and it came out in 1943. And it tells how the corporation I.G. Farben set up the Falange organization, and the purpose was to keep the uh, world safe for fascism and Nazism. By 1934, according to this book, Adolf Hitler summoned General Wilhelm van Fopel. He gave orders to him to set up an organization that was going in Germany called the Institute of Berlin, the Ibero-American Institute of Berlin, and joined the American to it. Uh, Mr. von Popel was not a scholar. He worked for I.G. Farben. He lived in Argentine and Buenos Aires, and worked for the War College down there and set up uh, a goal. The goal was to erase forever what they called the mob beast of democracy, that their goal in the 30s, uh, even before World War II started in the 20s, was total war to get rid of the mob beast of democracy. And after five years, they worked on this project. In 1926, uh, the Brazilian army, the Buenos Aires, Group, the military group were not only supporting Adolf Hitler and they went in to support Franco, but people that set up the uh, PLO later, the Falange organization, were men like Fritz Tyson, banker von Schroeder, Franz von Papen, the IG Farbens, George von Schnitzler. And they set all of South America as the bedrock for erasing democracy once and for all. And by 1943, when the Germans and the bankers realized that they could not beat the Soviet Union. 
They reformed the, the Falange group in Madrid, Spain, and many of the people behind the current assassinations in the intense desire for a total Nazi world and World War III, weakening America through these many wars like Korea and Southeast Asia and Central America and so forth, have been very busy. They set up their headquarters in Spain, IG Farben set it up, and set up the Falange. Now, this Mr. Habash that organized all of that uh, comes in information that I've had on the air for many, many years. One article I have from the Hudson Valley Chronicle is research done by Robert Byron Watson on the uh, assassination of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And this particular uh, document in research that Watson published is about his experiences down in Chile and in Beirut, Lebanon with Mr. George Habash and the role that these people had as Nazis in killing John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. In fact, he was at the shop in Atlanta, Georgia, where they were discussing the King murder one week before it took place. And Robert Watts, Byron Watson, has made connections to the Chilean government, the Nazis down there, a General Morales, and Walter Ruff, who was the SS colonel in Nazi Germany. And they worked, uh, George Habash's brother was down in Chile, George Habash was in Beirut, Lebanon, and the purpose was to keep the armies going, the Falange, that was set up even prior to World War II. And the same characters that were active in the Falange when Hitler was uh, putting Franco in power and starting the fascism around the world, those same people uh, have funded the PLO and blended in and encouraged the left to join them so that they thought they were working for a left movement and the a lot of the uh, so-called left, like the Bader Meinhof and the Red Brigade and so forth, Carlos, that were funded by the CIA and trained by George Habash and his brother, uh, have roots in the Falange. And not only do they have it, and I've studied it extensively, but it's interesting that this Claire Sterling at this point is giving the roots of the PLO and their links to Habash. Now, when I did a broadcast on the murder of John Lennon, Going back, this was uh, oh, this last year in December 1981, I did anniversary of Lennon's murder. I referred to the fact that Mark David Chapman was in Beirut, Lebanon, with the center of George Habash, where CIA assassination teams were set up, and how Habash worked in Chile and the American University in Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, this Mark David Chapman that killed John Lennon, who was a Jesus freak, traveled to CIA bases all over the world. And one of them was Lebanon before he came back to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, where Edwin Wilson and Frank Turpin were bringing their uh, tribesmen that were growing opium in Southeast Asia and bringing them back to the United States. And now they're supposed to be settling down in Jonestown, where Jim Jones had his territory. So the, the problem of the terrorism of identifying with what is going on, it is not, uh, it's a terrible thing to see Beirut completely laid flat with what the Israelis are doing. But even when the PLO are out, they'll always be in until we get to the roots of these problems and study them. There was another article in the paper today, Misgivings of Israel Backers, and there was a poll of people who uh, did not approve of what Israel was doing. I might say that for all of you that have heard me on the air and some have listened for 11 years and some have just picked it up recently, I happen to be Jewish, but I am not Zionist, and I'm not pro-Israeli. And you've never heard me say a program in favor of anything that Israel did. I've always been suspicious of Begin. I think he's a Nazi. When they compare him to Nazi Germany, they're not far off. I have nothing but total disrespect for him and the people that I have met. There's no Zionist who like me, who like my research, who like me delving into the Nazi connections. I don't have one Zionist friend at all, or one person along those lines who appreciates what I am doing or understands what I am doing. I've been suspicious of the roots of Israel and how it was formed for many, many years, particularly being Jewish and being suspicious of some of the behavior of these people. I am not sympathetic to anything they're doing. If they're an embarrassment to some people, I'm sorry, I didn't put them in. I would never run the country like that from the time it started, 1948, something was drastically wrong in the way they displaced the Palestinians. And then the Habash and the Nazis and the Falange could use it as a sore point to eventually wipe out Israel. So that those poor Jews that are collected under the umbrella 
of what is supposed to be a Jewish country uh, have to pay their dues. As long as they let their representatives ship arms to Taiwan and Argentina and South Africa and every fascist dictatorship that there is, uh, those people have to pay their dues. In the same way, we're going to have to pay our dues in this country. If you're going to sit back and watch a bloodbath in El Salvador and Guatemala and Iran or a coup in this country where our presidents are killed or our civil rights people are mutilated and, and killed and uh, racist uh, slaughters in this country where black men are shot down if they're with white women. And uh, if you sit in silence, you're going to pay your dues. That's all there is to it. Unfortunately, those that speak up will have to go with them, but it's worth the risk, and that's what I'm doing. But the crisis in Israel isn't over, and I think it was interesting how Claire Sterling was making connections of the Falange to the PLO to Habash because of those connections I was making to the murder of Martin Luther King and John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and John Lennon and many others. Now we have before the half hour break, we'll just cover one other assassination attempt news this week on the shooting of the Pope, the attempt to shoot the Pope. I've mentioned Aja before. An article this week in the paper, Aja tells the prosecutors who helped him plot the attack on the Pope. I don't know why he's talking now. Europe is much more sophisticated than the United States. They admit that there was a conspiracy. We haven't yet admitted that we've had a conspiracy. Somehow or other, they're hundreds of years older than us and a little more mature. He's mentioning a person uh, who is a group part of a right-wing organization. He had no previous police record. He's, he was an assistant in the shooting of the Pope, helped Aja with it. And he's mentioning his name. The suspect is Omer Baji, B-A-G-C-I. And he mentioned the right-wing organization that uh, helped wipe out, uh, try to wipe out the Pope. And, of course, I mentioned last week the second attempt of the Pope in Portugal and the links of the man who tried that just recently to another Nazi organization in Germany that uh, is linked to the Nazi network. Well, why are they after the Pope if he's so conservative? Uh, why are they uh, trying to shoot the Pope? Why are they trying to stamp the Pope? In essence, the Pope caught on to the fact of the scandal of Lysio Gelli and the Vatican Bank collapsing and the note that Mr. Marcinkus had signed, I guess, for $21. Billion that is supposed to be due. I read today that the Italian banks are going to help the Vatican out. The Pope got wind of the P2 scandal. It was in May when the whole story was breaking, and he was shot uh, May the 13th and almost killed, and it was just a matter of a few days later when the Italian government changed 180 degrees. So it wasn't that he's so liberal, he's an outright fascist, but he had wind of a scandal, and all of a sudden he decided to uh, quit the Masonic Lodge or to hush it under, have it go under, excommunicate people because it was a government even behind his back. Like Kennedy said, there's a government behind my back. Uh, the Pope couldn't have the two existing, and he survived the assassination attempt by the Nazi fascist group that wanted total fascism in Italy. And um, now Aja, one of the men who shot at him, is talking and making connections to other fascist groups. We'll take a break here for one minute and then get on with some other items in the news that are really important this week. Hey, this is Mae Brussel. I did want to say at the break now that all material brought up here, I'm entirely responsible. The station does not have to stand by. This is my responsibility for this news, as usual. No responsibility on the part of the station. Uh, an important article this week, Palimony visits the White House. Five million Palimony suit hits Ronald Reagan's friend. The major moral majority must be loving this, and in essence, it's more than a gossip story. This is about Alfred Bloomingdale. His wife is uh, the Nancy Reagan's best friend. They've been their close friends for years and years, part of the kitchen cabinet. A woman named Vicki Morgan is claiming that Bloomingdale gave her 18000 a month, and she has a contract for life. But the money stopped coming three weeks ago. July the 1st, the money didn't arrive. Now, I believe that just as Cardinal Cody had that mysterious woman and an extra million-dollar fund or the Gene Harris that traveled with Dr. Tarnauer. And uh, some of these various people are bag people working for the CIA. There was a, 
a uh, mysterious woman that traveled everywhere with William Holden, and I have to update that uh, murder one of these days. I keep promising that. But this woman met every single day. She was in the pizza business with him. Now, we know that the pizza, the mozzarella cheese, is allegedly, I'll say allegedly, 100% mafia. I've read studies on it. I'll pull them out if I can for you. 100% mafia. This woman looks like uh, a real... Uh, how should I describe you? I have to see your picture in the news, a gun mole or something. She's a pretty hard-looking woman. He meets her every day. He's a business partner, and he travels with her. Now, these people in high office have to have someone doing the, the gopher and go for this and go for that. In Hollywood, they're called, and elsewhere, they're gophers. And there's no way that he would have White House clearance with her every day, seeing her every day, going out of the White House, having the president in his home, and the president's wife, they've had such a close relationship. If, if Ronald and Nancy had any two close friends, it was these people. And there's no way you could keep a surprise or pull that on the president unless she has a role. And when her money dried up three weeks ago, I thought about Roberto Calvi, the president of the bank in Brogiano in Italy, hanging off that Blackfriars Bridge uh, before he could get down to Brazil. A, a real bag man with with the know-how of how the Vatican works and the super funding and the millions and billions of dollars is washing in and out of the Bahamas and everywhere. In fact, uh, this Paul Marcink is the archbishop gave up his uh, being on the board of the Bahama Bank of Ambrosiano this week. Today, he resigned just from that, not from Peru or Nicaragua or Luxembourg, but the Bahama section. So this man, Alfred Bloomingdale, meeting with her every day now, uh, he was like a father to her 12-year-old child, and she met him 12 years ago. So I would just make a wager with you, wouldn't you guess whose child that is and how uh, this man has this double life and in and out of the White House. Next week, I'll update you on Nancy's gopher. She's got a guy named Jerry Zipkin. I've been very anxious to do a story on him, but there's other news today. We'll follow this story of this uh, uh, Bloomingdale. Her money dried up, so she exposed uh, what uh, their relationship was and their source of contact for the last few years has been the pizza business. She does the traveling and visits with him. That's Ronnie and Nancy's gang. I read in the social com that Nancy had her birthday party at Chasen's this week and only Betsy was there and uh, her, her husband wasn't present. He's supposed to be homesick. You better believe he's homesick. I think they must all be sick. Oh, Alfred's out at Bel Air home. He's very sick. <laughs> it's so funny because the, the Reagans are such tacky people, just like the Nixons, you know, with the mob connections, the hoodlum, the phony pretenses, the tiaras, and nothing they can do is right. And so now their best friend is caught in a bind of giving a woman 18000 a month with a written contract for life. So you better believe those are some good pizzas that they're making out there. <laughs> I'll have to find that pizza parlor next time I go to L.A. Now, ex-spy uh, Mr. Edwin Wilson, he's asking for lower bail. He claims that uh, this week that he did a lot for the CIA, that he was in Rome in 1981 and, and met with the Justice Department, which I told you he did. it. That was just five weeks after the Pope was shot, and and his agent, Frank Turple, said that he knew a Jean the network. Uh, Wilson and Turple know who killed the uh, Sadat. They know who shot the Pope. They know who killed Allende and Pinochet and John Kennedy and you know what. He's asking to get out because he says even when he was overseas, he was doing a lot for the State Department. He also said besides glaucoma, he has a serious prostate con connection, which may be cancerous. Now, I believe that one. Uh, he may have a Martha Mitchell cancer. Maybe they'll let him out and he'll have his Martha Mitchell cancer and be dead in a couple of years or a year. Uh, maybe he's faking the illness, but maybe he isn't. Wilson wants the veil removed. The Spotlight newspaper that's put out by Liberty Lobby uh, had an article this week, The Tentacles of International Scandal Reach into the Reagan Administration. Now, a lot of people ask me, do I read Spotlight? I read as much as I can, uh, read, afford, and buy, and time-wise, as there is in Spotlight, is something I take. There's an article about a man in the Defense Department, Eric von Marbod, a German in the Defense Department, Richard Pearl, Secretary of Defense for International Security, Edward Lutwak, important on defense policy. He wrote the book Coup d'etat, and he knows how countries are overthrown and has participated in the sidelines of this. Richard Pipes and Stephen Bryan. And in this article, they have the names of all the top Defense Department Nazis, 
And then the scoop they have, they also have Thomas Kleins working with Edwin Wilson. What they're saying is the international scandal reaches into the Reagan administration, and they tie it to the Mossad over in Israel, to Israeli intelligence. Now, that may be true, because I think the Mossad is Nazi also. But all the people cited in the article are not uh, favors, uh, favorites of Israel or Jews. They have worked with the Galen establishment, the Nazi establishment, the Fritz Kramer, directly under Fritz Kramer in the Pentagon. In other words, uh, the essence of the article lists all the people that works with Edwin Wilson, but the Liberty Lobby always misses the connection. There's four letters they can't stay, say, and I can say those on the air and not the others. It's N-A-Z-I. They can't say that. They have to blame Israel, but they don't go into the roots of how Israel was formed or the role of Begin or the Mossad with these people. Now, this scandal reaches into the Reagan administration. Another point is that they don't say it reaches into the George Bush vice president because George Bush was the director of the CIA when Edwin Wilson headed Task Force 157 that just alone killed Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffat in Washington. If you want to get rid of these people that are doing the murdering and getting us on the brink of World War III, Bush is around the country parading for World War III and uh, giving speeches every single day and laughing about the anti-war protesters and how to put them down. If you want to get rid of them, just bring up these murders and put them all in the bundle and say, hey, get out and let's get with it. Before you kill us, what did you do with those other people? Now, the way they got Wilson home was to tell him that he was going to the Dominican Republic and he was there at the airport and left. Um, June the 16th, Edwin Wilson came to the United States and three weeks later, the president of the Dominican Republic was dead. Uh, the Mr. Gudsman was shot in the bathroom. Uh, the story was that he either committed suicide or his gun accidentally fell on the floor and jumped up and shot him. But uh, Wilson was down in the Dominican and been promised Salem. And goodness knows what connections the Dominican Republic has to Wilson. But there are direct connections of the Dominican Republic to the Vatican because Michael Sandoni is treasurer of the Vatican, bought a share of Gulf and Western, and I'll do more on that in a moment in detail. Gulf and Western controlled the sugar industry down in the Dominican Republic and had put Mr. Goodsman into power. So with the scandal of the funds of Michael Sedona drying up and the Vatican uh, writing the uh, bill for Roberta Calvi's bank, where $21.4 billion is being sent to South America, and out of Europe that belongs the Italians, a good hunk of the investment into Gulf and Western, to the Paramount Studios, to uh, many things in this country was tied up with Vatican funds, and one of them was the sugar industry down in Dominican Republic. As a matter of fact, Richard Nixon, in 1960, he lost the election to John Kennedy. He went to a law firm in New York City, and one of the first clients he had was the Torrio family. He made over $1 million dollars over in Spain, helping the family on their estate. And their father had been murdered by the CIA in the Dominican Republic to make way for Guzman, who then became the puppet of Gulf and Western and the Vatican. And uh, Richard Nixon had made over a million dollars in a little bit of paperwork off of the death of Mr. Trujillo down in the Dominican, making way for Mr. Guzman, who they later favored. Now, Mr. Guzman, before he died, had asked Gulf and Western, there was a lawsuit asking them for over $35 million that was taken from the country that belonged down in the Dominican Republic. So here is a man who allegedly was doing or preparing a safe haven, even if it was a decoy for Edwin Wilson. Here's a man who was asking Gulf and Western and a corporation that had combined with Sendona and the Vatican money for uh, just a few years ago for $35 million that belonged to these people controlling the sugar in the Dominican Republic. The CIA can get rid of one person who runs the country. They can get a big fee working for the family. Then they can make arrangements on the new sugar products with the next president now that the old one is out of office. And goodness knows if he retired, he could write a few books on that. One quick word on the airplane that went down in New Orleans, I 
I have no firm opinions. I didn't believe at all from the beginning it was lightning. Now they admit that there's other sounds on the boxes, and they're trying to find out what's on the recorder. They said on the NBC News last night they wouldn't know for six months what happened to the airplane. Because of so many scandals of people uh, being killed that are related to persons in the news trying to hold their position in the cabinet, such as Raymond Donovan or Archbishop Marcinkus at the Vatican, and uh, a lot of people are uh, treading dangerous water, even George Bush and Ronald Reagan with new exposures coming out. There's going to be a lot of hazards, a lot of crashes, a lot of suspicious deaths, and you can't tie them all together, but you have to watch the passenger list and see uh, how many, you know, uh, follow. You won't know that alone, but the passenger list was interesting in this particular uh, flight because there were so many people from different countries. Uh, I think the newspaper said 47 people from out of the country, but the area, Montevideo and Uruguay, and from Switzerland and Brazil and Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, Yugoslavia, the you can't come to any conclusions yet, but I'm watching the news on that because I picked up immediately that the Air Florida uh, flight last uh, January was sabotaged. And, of course, everything since that time has led to it and the people involved. And I should update that now with new articles, but we'll get into that soon. I can't pass another week without commenting on the latest in the John Belushi, uh, even if there are other articles I don't get to. This is important because Los Angeles Chief of Police Gates is talking about the case, and he gave a speech in the Valley in Los Angeles at Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association where he referred to John Belushi as nothing but a horrible person, a drug addict, and he said there are many other important crimes to solve. Gates, the chief of police of Los Angeles, said there was nothing more, than, he was nothing more than a guy looking for something, and the only th place he could find it was drugs. He died vomiting in the toilet, and he laid on some bed nude, and to me, that's a disgusting way to die. Now, I have to ask you a question because some of you are not aware of it and some of you are. Do you ever know what happened to Howard Hughes in the Los Angeles Police Department with Ed Davis and Daryl Gates, who worked under Davis? He's, Davis is now a senator in California. Do you know that Howard Hughes was taken in 1957 to a bungalow in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hills Hotel and drugged out of his head till 1966? And then he was taken to a Boston hospital and was never seen again. And the Hughes Empire went into Vegas and bought up six hotels and ran with television screens like Voyeurs, everything that went on, every congressman uh, compromised and blackmailed. And the Hughes, uh, he left one night on a Thanksgiving night, went down to the Bahamas. The Hughes organization bought the downstairs of the hotel, like the fifth floor. He was supposed to be on the sixth. Then the seventh floor, they boarded the windows with wood, put black curtains over the windows so no airplane could see who was in there. Now, all this time, he was a, one of the largest defense contractors in the United States. In fact, there's a book by Noah Dietrich that said, Howard, the used aircraft, like with the U-2s, the communications, the airplanes, the technology, you're the most important person for the security of the United States. And do you know that no American, even Governor Laxall of Nevada, who ran Ronald Reagan's campaign, ever saw him. Robert May, who set up the assassination teams of John Robert and Martin and Malcolm and all those other people, worked for the Hughes organization, the CIA, never saw him. And when they cashed in that body in 1976, he was a, they said it was like a body out of Dachau. And the guards worked with the Los Angeles Police Department, and it had needles in its body. It was like 80-pound skeleton. Whether it was Vance Cooper or Hughes isn't even the point. If they substituted a man buried in that grave, Vance Cooper, that was the Los Angeles Police Department was running the Hughes organization on Romaine Street. I mean, let's get the record straight once and for all. Who is rotten in this country? Is there anything more rotten than what they did to a man getting defense contracts? If Belushi entertains us, if we want his movies, we can see them. It's not up to him to say he died vomiting in the toilet and lay on the bed nude. And to me, that's a disgusting way of not to die. Do you know, I think if we open up the Howard Hughes case, we could stop World War III. And, and uh, just to show how these people are... Uh, lying to us, the police department, the courts in Los Angeles, the courts in Houston on the case of Howard Hughes. How are they to decide 
that John Belushi, even if he did take those drugs, and there's evidence that the, they were fresh needle marks and that she did 28 that night, she said, or 24, their holier-than-thou attitude, you know he was rotten, he had fans. Well, didn't, uh, wasn't there some obligation of Howard Hughes if he had fans? You know, he, he bought up the Hughes aircraft, and at the time there was a multi-million dollar lawsuit because stock people that own stock in Hughes aircraft lost a lot of money, and they claimed that the user organization depressed the stock so that they could buy it up cheap. And there was a lawsuit demanding the presence of Howard Hughes at the trial, and the user organization spent $79 million. Because that was their penalty for not having Howard Hughes show up. There was no use. And the person they cashed in, you talk about drugs, and you read the 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 history of Howard Hughes and what went on, and uh, it's shocking. And the police chief down there talking about one John Belushi, he doesn't defend this country. He can entertain us or you can turn him off. I happen to like him. His crime, John Belushi's crime, was that he was going to make the movie Moon Over Miami. His crime was that he was going to show the FBI people as narcotic dealers from Colombia and that when they were supposed to be investigating the crime, they were actually the drug dealers, and that's, in fact, what they are. Incidentally, Robert De Niro, who has not been called by the police department, they said, we have no reason to ask him. I read yesterday that he just hired a new attorney for a movie he's making called Paul Ray Jr., for technical advice, who did John uh, Robert De Niro hire? An attorney who was the attorney for Vito Genovese, who was, again, linked to Raymond Donovan and our Secretary of Labor, Johnny Dio, Jimmy Hoffa, again, linked to Richard Nixon, Alexander Haig, and the entire uh, Labor Committee, Mr. George Schultz, and Raymond Donovan, and Mickey Cohn. This man, uh, Paul Ray Jr., is now working for Robert De Niro, the attorney for Genovese, Johnny DeVio, Jimmy Hoffa, and Mickey Cohn. And Mickey Cohn, of course, worked with the CIA. And uh, the whole thing is disgusting. They're so up to their neck in crime, in drugs, narcotic, in murder down there. And they have the nerve to keep coming on and lashing at these people as if they deserve to die. There was an article in the Los Angeles Times recently, LAPD to pay $27,500 for a terror campaign. They found a professor down there, an architect rather, he, he taught architecture, and he had left his views. So they sent him death threats, they, told, they slashed his tires. The detective service of the LAPD, it's called the Department's Public Disorder Intelligence Division. It's been described as a fascist terrorist Gestapo. Uh, gave him death threats. For two years, he was under constant uh, surveillance because he went to a protest march in Raleigh, North Carolina, in 1974. They threatened his children, his home, and uh, just drove him, you know, really uh, almost crazy. And finally, they sued the LAPD. They have nothing else to do, you see. They take somebody who wants peace, who's interested in minding his own business and building nice buildings, and then they have a whole department there to harass this person and give him death threats and, and so forth and slash his tires and rock through his living room. Well, this architect won the 27000 Is Along the lines of the LAPD, there's a new book coming out called Indecent Exposure. It's by a man on Wall Street, and I'll be doing a lot on this because this has to do with the Hollywood the mob and the scumbag assassination teams that are running the studios. The writer is David McClintock, McClintock. It's a book by uh, put out by Murrow and Company, and it's about Hollywood, Columbia Studios, where David Bagelman was forging checks, paychecks of actors and taking money, and his attorney, Mr. Rothman, and a Alan Hirschfeld, all involved at Columbia Studios in in this book, one review of it, the Los Angeles Times said, the case successively involves the police departments of Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, Burbank, the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, the Security Exchange Commission, the FBI, the Burbank Municipal Courts. Well, you could bring in the uh, Jack Eggers, the Beverly Hills Police Department, the work of the LAPD that started to drug Howard Hughes, who was an inventor and a flyer, and worked with airplanes and contributed for whatever it was worth to this country, and they could take over that whole youth organization as a network for the Nazification of America. Those people have been involved in so much. Now, Bagelman went on. Uh, he wasn't punished. He didn't go to jail. He worked and corrupted these federal agents, and they worked with him. He went on to become president of MGM, 
Uh, he, he was president and is, at the time, Natalie Wood had er, early demise. Alan Hirschfeld went on to become president of 20th Century Fox that uh, Marvin Davis bought that owns Pebble Beach. They put Madame Chenault on the board and Henry Kissinger and Jerry Ford and Princess Grace from Monaco. Hirschfeld's over 20th Century Fox. And Mr. Rothman, who was involved in the scandal at Columbia, became the attorney for MGM. Did they get their punishment? No. The, the fascist network and the police department and the FBI, the work hand in glove, can continue promoting any stars they want, drugging any stars they want, murdering anyone they want. But along comes a Belushi, and the police department says, we have more important deaths than that. If you just solve that, if you solve the John Lennon assassination, you'd know a lot about this country. Now, finally, in the last seven minutes that I have, I want to talk about Mr. Marcinkus at the Vatican, Archbishop Marcinkus. I've been talking about him for many years on the year. I never could figure out how a fellow with direct links and organizations with Sendona and Gulf and Western to Al Capone gang in Cicero, Illinois, with direct connections, becomes the bodyguard and the banker for the Vatican, for the religious institution in Italy that is so revered by so many. This week, an article in the newspaper, the Pope has been asked to fire the Vatican's top banker. The Italian banking officials have asked to fire Mr. Marcinkus. He's the Pope's bodyguard and trusted advisor. He signed the notes for the Vatican for Roberta Calvi, who was murdered two weeks ago in London. He signed the questionable high-risk loans of $1.4 billion to three Latin American subsidiaries of Banco Ambrosiano. In other words, the Vatican signed the OK. You can send $1.4 billion, and that isn't Lissio Gelli's money. That was $21 billion of Italian tax money that went down to South America. I bring this up because when I talk about the Falange or the gold from the 1920s to the 1930s, of Hitler, Hitler's agents, their banks, down to Argentine, Brazil, their intent to overthrow democracy. They have had this constant goal since the time of the Russian Revolution when the czarists were kicked out and the monarchies were removed. The Vatican has been fearful of communism, of course, and they worked with the worst elements, the fascist elements that they put into power, and the money that is flowing out is going over and over again down to South America and around the world to come back to this country in terms of overthrowing this country. They're funding congressmen. They control the news media for the most part. That's why it's so important, again, to sponsor stations like this where you can say these things. You can't say it on ABC radio up in San Francisco or L.A. or nationally. That The attorney in the West Coast is Greg Bowser, who was Howard Hughes' attorney when he was zonked out of his head. Now, they're asking for Marcinkus to retire. He resigned this week from the board of directors of the Bahamas subsidiary of Banco Ambrosiano. Now, Sedona had offered a million dollars to Richard Nixon's campaign. Wouldn't you love to know the Bahamas connection? Can you just see B.B. Rebozo and Mr. Avalonap and, and Ron, uh, Ronald Reagan's friends and Richard Nixon's friends in the Bahamas? The first bank that he resigned from was the Bahamas, and, of course, that's it's the headquarters of the Thysons and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and the Wenergren and the entire Swedish-Norwegian Nazi headquarters during World War II and after World War II. They set up their havens in the Bahamas along with ITT and William Stevenson of British Intelligence. Another article, The Scandal May Touch the Vatican Bank Chief. It may touch. It's been going on for so long. What really finalized, it wasn't the eight or so judges and investigators of the Sedona Vatican Mafia links, the Gambino family, the narcotics flow into this country from the Middle East uh, with the church money. That didn't do it. One judge after the other was killed. One witness after the other was killed. What brought this to a head this last week was Roberto Calvi hanging over that bridge in London. I have to say again, 18,000 in his pocket, a passport to Brazil with an alias, mustache shaved off, hanging off Blackfriar Bridge in London. That set the the banking scandal going full-blown because he had gone to the Vatican to bail him out of his debt of his missing millions, and they didn't uh, uh, come to his aid. He, he got it all hanging off the bridge. That was their answer. But they can't separate Roberta Calvi 
from Carl, from Paul Masinkas, the Cicero Capone gang, the Sedona Gambino plant gang, so that there's these floating millions and billions, and there will be many deaths or crashes. Remember that Edwin Wilson's expertise was airplane crashes. That's what he taught uh, uh, in Libya, Gaddafi. That's what he taught Idi Amin, the PLO, and the anti-Castro Cubans. How to kill, how to blow up airplanes uh, and do it successfully. That's one of his expertise. So with Wilson home and Calvi hanging, I keep bringing this up, and with Donovan in the hot spot, uh, the Vatican involved, we're going to see not every tragedy that happens is going to be related, but you have to save the articles and follow them closely. Now, the time is almost up. I have a lot more. I filled almost over 120 file folders of important stories this week, but we'll take them one at a time and do them as slowly as is necessary because some of these names are new, new to you and some of them aren't. I want to remind you again two things. I will meet next Sunday from 4 to 6, and as I say, the weather is nice. We can meet afterwards and stay outside and talk as long as you want until I answer every question that you want to know, whether it's the Nazi connections or the uh, Vatican uh, organized crime connections, uh, who's behind the assassinations, how far can they go, what can we do about it. That is important. Now, you can't do all the studying without asking, uh, are there solutions? Is there anything you could do? The Forces of history are not determined by a lot of people. Maybe 10% of the entire population can change history. And out of that, 5% want changes for maybe the better, for a humanistic approach, for sharing, for not hurting, not causing pain. And 5% have the power to do a lot of damage. They're zealots. They will die. They'll use the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb. They will cause mass deaths, whatever it takes to get the power. They want power. The other group do not necessarily want power. And unfortunately, the zealot, that 5%, work 24 hours a day, all 5% of them, for what they want. And the other 5% that uh, want changes uh, maybe do it part-time. It's not a 24-hour thing with them. It's not a consuming thing. And those that do work at it hard do make changes and will be remembered for making changes, and there are some of those people. So we'll meet next week, and uh, for those of you that aren't in the area where you can get down, you many of you call me all week long. The phone's ringing or write letters, and I can answer your questions. If you're not here, I'll answer them. And remember, please send money to KAZU. I'm going to ask you every week, and I'm going to ask you to send more every week. If you don't send a check this week, I'll add five next week. This is May Bressel, and I'll be back with you next week. You've been listening to... World Watchers with May Brussel on KAZU Pacific Grove. May will be back next Monday at 7.30 to 8.30. Thank you.